Hi, Dr. Windish from Sparks Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine here. Welcome to our video series for both parents and professionals. Today this video is really uh, directed towards medical professionals. Um, remember these videos are not intended in any way, shape, or form to replace visits with your physician. If we can be of assistance here, give us a call at 775-359-7111. Today what we want to talk about is conjugated vaccines, what makes them special, what makes them different from polysaccharide vaccines, why we conjugate a vaccine, and how that helps with the amnestic immune response. Uh, this video is really intended for professionals. Of course, anybody's welcome to watch it, but if you don't have a background in immunology, it may be a little bit over your head. I uh, want to point out this is us. This is our Facebook page. Please like us on Facebook so you can follow what we're doing a little bit better. So let's kind of get into it, shall we? So let's start by looking at the immune response um, over time. A typical immune response over time. Okay, we're going to start by drawing the IgM. All right, so you have a certain circulating level of IgM. You get sick, that IgM level comes up, then it comes back down. Okay, this is on initial exposure. Your IgG will do something like this. If you've never been exposed to the antigen before, okay, on re-exposure, however, your IgM will again be at its normal circulating levels, will again have its peak, okay, but your IgG will have its circulating levels and on exposure, and this is the point of exposure right here. Okay, for both video, or for both charts, point of exposure is roughly right here. Excuse me for not drawing such a straight line. But on re-exposure, it goes up rapidly and it goes up very high. This is what's this right here is what's known as the amnestic immune response, and this is what we're trying to make happen with vaccines. Okay, so what is a conjugated vaccine? Well, the immune response has kind of a pecking order, or the immune system has a, let's try that again, nope, there we go, the immune system has a pecking order in, in which it will respond to things, okay, its preferred thing to respond to is protein. After that, the next best response will be a polysaccharide. After that will be a lipid and uh, um, either DNA or RNA. Meaning pretty low. You, you don't get much of an immune response down here, okay? So your immune system's really designed with regards to antibodies anyway to respond first to proteins, then polysaccharides. So what happens? Well, the ideal 
epitope for an antibody to respond is 7 to 10 amino acids long. Much shorter than 7 to 10 amino acids, you don't develop much of an immune response. Much longer than that, you have multiple epitopes. And the immune response can, can respond to multiple sites on there, which might be a, a, a good thing when you're dealing with a virus. Creates some difficulty in a laboratory when you're trying to make a monoclonal antibody. If you have polysaccharides, however, you don't get the greatest immune response. Okay, And with polysaccharides, there's a couple of issues. So what are the issues with polysaccharides? Well, issue number one is uh, you don't get good class switching from IgG to IM, uh, IgM to IgG. Okay. With that, you don't get good memory. All right, and the worst part is you can't boost it. When we look at geometric mean titers of antibodies, in response to polysaccharide vaccines, they do something like this. So we give the vaccine at this point, they go up, they say st say stay sustained, okay, but then over many years, and we're going to put this double hash mark here because there's a break in time in this, um, in this chart, as well as a change in scale, okay, they start to fall. usually not down to zero, but they do start to fall, okay? Oops. If we were dealing with a protein, we know we could give another exposure here. And at this point, we would boost the response. And maybe this time we'd, we'd get the class switching we want, and it'd stay permanent. However, because this is a, a polysaccharide, when we give a booster exposure here, we actually drop the geometric mean titers faster, typically speaking. So you get a worsening immune response, not an improved immune response. All right, so what are the scenarios wherein we're worried about this sort of thing? Well, the scenarios from a clinical standpoint are your encapsulated polysaccharide uh, bacteria. And when we're trying to make vaccines to those, we need to come up with some sort of an alternative. So what are the big ones? Well, the big ones currently are Haemophilus influenza type B. Actually, that should be a capital I. Pneumococcus and meningococcus. Okay, or uh, streptococcus pneumoniae and Neisseria meningitidis. All of these bacteria, when we look at them, have, actually let's do this, have this fuzzy polysaccharide cloud around the outside. Okay, this prevents antibodies from attaching to the bacterium itself. So what you really need is antibodies to the polysaccharide. The problem we run into is this is a polysaccharide, and so you don't get good class switching, you don't get good memory. So what do we do? Well, we take out and we break down the polysaccharide, we get a piece of polysaccharide, okay, and then we conjugate to it or attach to it a piece of protein of some sort. 
this is what we call a conjugated vaccine. This now will get me Let's see, where's my missing layer? Will get me, whoops. this desired response right here, okay, with its incipient memory. Where are we? Okay, there we are. Okay. as opposed to this response followed by a no memory. Why do we care? Well, these encapsulated, not all of the bacteria are encapsulated. So Haemophilus influenza has multiple types, but types with the type B capsid, those are invasive. Pneumococcus, same thing. Meningococcus, same thing. If they don't have, if they're mutants that don't have the capsid, we don't worry too much about them. Okay, so this now is the difference between, for example, uh, the old pneumovax. Whoops. This is unconjugated and conjugated. And Prevnar. Okay, it's also the difference between the old meningococcus vaccine and MCV. And we n were never able to develop an even semi-functional Haemophilus influenza polysaccharide vaccine. So all we have is Hib conjugate. Why do we care about boosting? Well, let's look at Pneumovax. And I think that's the perfect example here of why we care about boosting. The recommendations have always been to give at, and I don't treat adults, between 60 to 65 years of age. We can just ignore that for a minute. Well, back in the day, you gave it, so, and we've had this vaccine for doggone near 30 years. So if you gave it at right, 65 years of age, and at the time, the average lifespan was 70 years of age, and the vaccine lasts for 5 to 10 years. By the time immunity wears off, you're 70 to 75 years old. Immunity wears off, and you die of old age. Okay, that was great 30 years ago. But people are living well into their 80s now. So what happens if you want to live to be 85 years old? You can't boost the patient. And who needs the vaccine more? Who needs to be prevented against pneumonia more? The 60-year-old or the 80-year-old? Of course, it's the 80-year-old. But you can't boost them. So you just got to put up with that lower gene, mean geometric titer. Or you can use the conjugate vaccine and at age 75 whoops, sorry, 75 or 85, you can boost, at least theoretically. The current recommendations are not to give a booster dose later, but 
stay tuned for that one because that in the field of vaccine research is a major area of research. You're going to find a booster dose. And we, it's only been recently that um, the PCV13 was um, uh, FDA approved for use in patients over 60. Uh, but you're going to find now that we're using that, that um, the response to waning immunity is going to be recommending a booster dose at some point in time in the future, and that's going to resolve that problem. By the way, what do these numbers mean? Okay, because we have PPV, the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, 23, and PCV, 13. Okay, PPV, 23 is the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, 23 valent. All right, so it covers the 23, 23 of the most common uh, types of um, types of uh, pneumococcus. But PCV only covers 13, so 23 must be better, right? Well, uh, from the standpoint of you cover more valences, yeah, but from the standpoint of lifelong immunity for the rest of your life so that you don't die from this disease when you're in your late 80s, no, the PCV13 is the way to go because you can boost it. Furthermore, type 6 is the most common of the valences um, of invasive pneumococcus that cause pneumonia in the elderly and guess what it's in PCV 13 but not in PPV 23 because this valence didn't become a problem it was a um, sort of an emerging valence back in the 1970s when this vaccine was being developed so nobody gave it any consideration at the time. It's not thrown into this. When PCV13 was being made, this particular valence was already around wreaking havoc medically, so it was studied and added to the PCV13. So no, in fact, the most common type of pneumonia is not covered by the PPV23. It is by the PCV13. So what are the advantages in the elderly of pneumovax or of um, pneumococcus one we can boost it two covers um, pneumococcus or, or strep, pneumoco strep streptococcus pneumoniae type six Three, you actually get memory. Okay? In my book, my background as an immunologist, as a bench researcher in immunology, my background as a pediatrician who gives thousands of vaccines each year, this is compelling, especially the ability to boost and the memory. And of course, from an infectious disease standpoint, this is pretty compelling as well, having coverage for the most common type of disease, but I'm not an infectious disease doctor. So from a scientific standpoint, the first and the third are the most compelling. From an ID standpoint and a population standpoint, it's actually number two. Either way you go. I know people are, unless you do pediatrics for a living, people tend to be very confused about the concept of conjugating and why we would want to conjugate and again this is the reason okay what we use here in PCV 13 is actually a part of the diphtheria molecule we don't use the whole diphtheria molecule and I don't remember which piece we're using these days but we're using a part of the diphtheria molecule because it induces such robust immunity and specifically although it's a protein, although it's diphtheria, and we're not really worried about diphtheria immunity, at least with regards to this vaccine, it induces immunity to this. And this we are concerned about. So, I hope this has helped to kind of enlighten you on... Um, polysaccharide vaccines versus um,
protein vaccines, for example, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, or for example, the diphtheria vaccine, which are protein vaccines, and help you to understand why we do what we do, but also understand why there's suddenly this new push to use this newer vaccine, even though it covers fewer valences. Uh, it does provide some, some major advantages over the old polysaccharide vaccines, most most importantly, lifelong immunity uh, and an ability to boost it. Um, this is what we've been doing in pediatrics for a long time now, almost 25 years, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and it has made just a tremendous difference in uh, long-term outcomes for our kids. It has prevented a lot of morbidity and mortality from these encapsulated bacteria that could not have been accomplished with the older vaccines. If we can be of assistance here, give us a call at area code 775-359-7111. That's our phone number right here. Please like us on our Facebook page so you can follow us and see our new movies and realize we can't help you over the, we can't care for your child over the internet uh, or over the telephone, but we are well uh, happy to see you here in our office uh, same day if we need to. So give us a call. Have a good day and we'll see you next time.